quite an interesting report you put out on Nigeria and Angola, obviously, too, uh, and the fact that both countries remain uh, dependent on oil and, of course, the, that risk associated with being dependent on that uh, commodity. But help us understand, uh, talk us through the key highlights of this report. You've talked about the fact that there's fiscal consolidation and that could help plug the deficit of especially Nigeria. Talk us through that. Yeah, no, we, we just published a, a peer comparison report on Nigeria that we rate at B2 with a stable outlook and Angola that we rate at B3 with a stable outlook as well uh, because they are the two largest oil exporters in the sub-region and they weight 40% of the sub-Saharan GDP uh, put together. So um, the, the, the rebound in oil price, in a sense, uh, we, has helped the countries to uh, emerge from recession, and we expect uh, a public finance and external position to stabilize. But at the same time, the fact that it's mainly due to the rebound in oil price and production for, for Nigeria means that um, uh, in this environment, the key structural risks remain. And the challenges are, are there. For example, uh, there is a risk that the, the, the structural reforms are not implemented. Uh, one of the biggest challenges uh, uh, for both countries is uh, their ability to raise non-oil taxes. And because all, all price, all proceeds are quite uh, significant, higher than budgeted for both countries, uh, maybe there, there is not going to be uh, as much as effort uh, uh, made during the next few years. And this is uh, very important because the, the, the interest burden, the debt affordability, the, the interest paid uh, compared to the level of revenue for these countries has skyrocketed uh, uh, over the last few years. Uh, in the case of, of uh, Nigeria, it was less than 10 percent, it's close to 30 percent today, uh, uh, the ratio. And for uh, Angola, it was less than 2 percent, and now it's 20 percent. And so the, the, this is this kind of risk that we highlighted in, uh, in the report. Now, you also highlighted in your report that both countries face the challenge of attracting more investment in a no low oil price environment. But for Nigeria, we know that we've seen uh, some reforms uh, uh, in the oil and gas industry, the Petroleum uh, Industry and Governance Bill that has, you know, scaled through secondary. I mean, we're expecting that to uh, come through uh, finally. And so, I mean, some might argue that that is a, a significant step in creating the, the right environment for more investments to come in. Is that something you also factored in uh, as you look at the ability of Nigeria to raise or to attract more investments in the, uh, in the oil and gas industry? No, the PIB bill is absolutely a uh, key uh, for the for the future of the sector because there is a need of a framework for investing in the oil and gas sector in in uh, in Nigeria. Uh, similarly, also Angola is uh, is working on on putting a framework for gas because they have gas, but it was not exploited uh, uh, un uh, properly until now. So the, both countries are trying still to develop this sector, but. The real diversification of the economy will only uh, uh, be uh, 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 real uh, uh, when the government revenue will be uh, not vulnerable to uh, 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 price volatility of their commodities, of, of oil, and also when they will be able to tax uh, the non-oil economy, which for the moment is very poor. We uh, forecast, for example, in the case, in the case of Nigeria, on average, a level of, of, of general government revenue around 7.7 percent of GDP in, in 2018-19, and it's only 19 uh, percent in Angola's case. Both uh, ratios are well below their peak pre-oil shock, meaning that there is still a, a long way to recover a, a, a high level of, of, uh, of government revenue. Well, that being said, speaking about, still speaking on non-oil revenue, Nigeria does have a plan. I'm sure you're aware of it uh, uh, as it reforms its uh, tax policy at a national level also uh, to increase its tax-to-GDP ratio from 6% to 15% in a couple of years. And we've seen some traction. Uh, we've seen some of the initiatives uh, 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 produce uh, very positive results, especially the, uh, the voluntary assets and income declaration scheme, which I'm sure you're aware about. So with that plan in place and with the traction that we're seeing, uh, do you look at it and say that, okay, fine, in the, in the next couple of years, we could see the non-oil revenue uh, grow significantly? Or do you have doubts uh, about the implementation or 
it actually increase in the debt to GDP ratio? Yeah, unfortunately, um, all these efforts are, are commendable. But when you look since 2015, uh, uh, most of these eff efforts have been unsuccessful to really increase non-oil revenue, uh, despite some results in some, uh, some uh, sectors and, and some reforms. Uh, the, 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 the level of non-oil revenue in terms of GDP has, has barely moved. So uh, maybe it will lead some results, but it is the same thing for Angola as well. The new president is uh, is uh, uh, as set, uh, as uh, is driving the reform. Uh, they announced uh, an IMF program, uh, installation of VAT, uh, urban property taxes. But all that is something that is going to come in the future. Uh, and today, looking at the institutional strength of these two countries that are. Uh, very weak in our assessment. It's still early to say if it's going to be successful, but definitely this is a, a, a direction that could improve the credit profile if uh, these reforms uh, in fine are successful. Aurelien, thank you for talking to us today. We appreciate your time.